the global adventures. Um, and the, the really key thing, as he says, is to note that it has deep, deep roots in this valley. Uh, Moose, um, Cash Valley brand, uh, his Swiss family heritage has been here for a long, long time. And we could go on and on, but given that he has a most impressive talk to provide us, I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Bob Smith. discoveries and, and then what's happening now. I'll go through a summary to make sure people have a good background of what we're talking about. But I'm going to head to these web tools. And I'm doing this because for many, many years, people have said, how do we get this? How do we get that? And they send me emails. How do we get that? Well, I'm going to show you what the tools are. And I'll show you the links. Then you go to my web page and get them. Because they're all on there right now. And I'll tell you about two or three of our recent discoveries keep you up to date and interested. I have to acknowledge a lot of people that have uh, made this a successful career. As you can see, uh, my, my program started in 1956 when I was a GS0 at <laughs> Yellowstone National Park for the Fish and Wildlife Service, and I was charged with mapping the entire Yellowstone Lake and River drainage for fisheries, but I was out actually looking at the geology of stream in terms of sedimentation and such. So I covered all of Yellowstone. We could have time, no GPS, no radio, you know, 30-year-old maps, and we were on our own. But that's how I got started in this. And I want to say that I've had a great deal of support from both Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Parks. These guys have been wonderful to me over my career, and I acknowledge that. This is my research group that I'll get to in a moment. I've been funded for many, many years by the National Science Foundation, the Park Service, Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, and this is the University of Utah Seismograph Station. Earthscope is a program of the NSF that I helped found. And of course, I was an original member of the Teton Science School in 1976. And I've been on the board ever since. As they say, you check in, you can't check out. <laughs> These are one of some of the foundations that are supporting the things, the research that we do. Well, Yellowstone's America's hotspot, and I just want to point out, of course, it was back in 2005 that BBC produced this Yellowstone Super Volcano production. And uh, this is, of course, taken from that production. And they did actually a good job. We were advisors to them, but they were on an enormous amount of global awareness. What they actually did, though, is they took a very rare possibility of an eruption and they made it sound like it was imminent. But nonetheless, it brought a lot of attention to Yellowstone and to the geology, the fact that Yellowstone is a volcano national park. Most people before this time didn't know Yellowstone was part of an active volcano or a very major active earthquake zone. So if you over here to the left, I'm plotting here the earthquakes of what's called the Intermountain Seismic Belt. You know, back in 1970-75, this belt was not, I wouldn't say discovered, it wasn't really acknowledged. And when I got to the university, I said, man, this is like a silver platter. Look at all these earthquake zones, St. George, up through the Wasatch, and then up into the Teton, Yellowstone area, and around over toward Moore Peak, and then continuing on up to Canada. 
Well, here's the seismicity map of the region that we're going to talk about. And I want to point out that the earthquake pattern comes up from essentially north of the Star Valley area and swings into southern Jackson Hole. And of course, I went up to look for earthquakes on the Teton Fault back in 1967. And there were very few to none. I said, this is a very big active fault. What's going on? Well, I'm not going to get into the Teton seismicity, but I want to talk about how these linear zones of earthquakes come across Yellowstone and how they're related to the caldera and how this enormous earthquake, Hebden Lake, 1959, killed 28 people. It's a magnitude 7.3. And all the old locations are up here off the end of the fault. Our new location put it clear down the south end of the valley buried at about 15 kilometers. So it's a very important place, and I point this out, the Teton Fault actually occupies a seismic gap. Well, bear that in mind when you buy your next when you buy your next earthquake insurance. <laughs> now I'm plotting here uh, for background, of course the topography in the green brown colors. And I'm plotting here of these centers of volcanism that were associated with the same kind of volcanism we see today up the Snake River Plain to Yellowstone. It's dominantly rhyolitic, it's bimodal rhyolitic basaltic volcanism, and this is the track of the Yellowstone hotspot 16 million years ago, 14, 12, 11, etc. What's amazing is that this track of old Yellowstones, if you wish, is surrounded by this tectonic parabola of earthquakes. So it's like a bow wave in water. What is it? It's a bow wave in the Earth's plastic portion of the crust at a depth of very shallow, maybe five or six miles. The North American plate is moving to the southwest. And of course, we have a candle of heat, which I'm going to show you is a giant plume from the, core, from the, from the mantle it comes up and interacts with the bottom of the lithospheric plate. And so this track, 800 kilometers long, tells you that the hot spot was here long before it was here. And the reason is the plates moved that far at two and a half centimeters per year. The hot spot is going to be fixed in the earth, the plates moving over it. And we have the surrounding tectonic parabola, we call it, and the associated earthquake zone, which means that there's high stresses related to these high topographic regions around it compared to this lower regions of the Snake River Plain that are actually subsiding. And as they subside, they bend the shoulders down and they create excess stresses when you bend a, an elastic plate. So this is, I am a geophysicist, so I'll explain it in terms of stress and strain. Now I want to make very clear to you that People that know me, I like to do everything. So I integrate a lot of things to understand the Yellowstone system. First, I'm going to show you this at the end. There's a giant plume of magma down to a depth. Uh, we imaged it to 800 kilometers. It's been now imaged to 1,500 kilometers. This is an isosurface, meaning it's a seismic image of seismic low velocity that surrounds this conduit of rising magma. And it comes up when it hits beneath the northern lithospheric plate that pulls it to the southwest. Well, fluids come off of this body and they fuel a crustal magma reservoir that is as shallow as two to three kilometers in the northeast of Yellowstone and as deep as about 10 to 15. Well, this magma body is what created Yellowstone's volcanism. And if you look at this pattern here, it's what's uplifted the Earth's surface. This is a contour map using radar interferometry, and each one of these contours is 28 millimeters. Well, I also put the GPS vectors on in red during the same time period, and the whole system is going upward, and the horizontal vectors are outward. So just think of putting your hand under a, a rubber membrane, you push it up, sides go out, top goes as an uplift. So, this whole system really relates to me back to understanding what this volcanic system is developed from, where it's driven. 
Well, it's driven really from the magma pool <coughs> deep in the earth. We have heat flow, we, of course we have a shallow magma, we have active ground deformation, I'm showing you the most active earthquake area in the inner mountain region, hydrothermal volcanic features, and these are all double arrows because everything's interrelated to the other. So you cannot understand one without knowing the other. And that's the point we, we made very strongly in our studies that we use multiple methods and multiple systems and multiple kinds of models to put these, all of these processes together. Because I'm always interested in what, how, what's the physics of what makes things work? What makes a geyser work? What makes an earthquake work? What makes a plume work? Now, I'm going to start out by saying this is my research group at the University of Utah, and we have on our website all the real-time earthquake data within 10 milliseconds. See, that's pretty fast. We have all our journal articles, all our GPS data, and the public seismology tools are right here. And I'm going to go through these one by one in my presentation and show you how they work. But you can go to my website and grab these when you, you get through, and if you're interested in following up on these different kind of tools that the public has access to. The majority of them are non-password protected, because well, you have to get a password, and a few of them you have to download their software. Now let's see if this works. Well, I just clicked on to show you. This is where we're, things we're gonna talk about. Yellowstone seismic data, real-time maps. These are some of our reports. Is this thing on? That's a map. I'm going to show you all the earthquake data together. California Seismic Network, which now integrates the whole United States. And these are networks of seismic data, GPS data, then a Voyager, which is a software package that puts earthquakes and volcano information together and then on to the earthquake volcano notification system. And I'm going to end up with the brand new 2014 USGS hazard map. <coughs> now, it's be tricky. So this is our website at the university. And uh, when you log into the University of Utah seismograph stations, we have, we call them web recorders. These are just seismograms that are put onto the web. And we have a real-time earthquake map for Utah and Yellowstone. We also have it in between. But we are considered an advanced national seismic network region. So these areas outlined by squares here are called authoritative region. And uh, so when there's lots of earthquakes going on here, people call me up. I don't issue press releases for the Teton region because under our agreement, under the Advanced National Seismic System, that's really a, a function of the USGS, which funds us to actually do the monitoring. But regardless, you can go to this map and its earthquakes are shown uh, in the last hour, in the last day, in the last week. And you can go to all of these sites we have listed here. But importantly, you can actually go to our seismograms There's an earthquake station map of Utah, for example. And you can go to this, these kind of sites and see all of the related. If I can go back. Here's a map of the stations in Yellowstone. These are telemeter. We bring in 160 real-time channels of GPS and seismic data from this network of 35 seismic stations. We have about 25 GPS stations. These stations telemeter their data primarily by microwave links that go from Yellowstone, if you wish, up to Mount Washburn, which is right up here. And then they get radio telemeter to Sawtail Peak, the FAA facility, and it comes directly through the FAA links to us. But you can go to any one of these sites and you can pick off a station, and there's today's seismogram in real time. You see, that's what's happening right now. Now, this one's a little delayed. This one's delayed by about four minutes. But it's not bad. <laughs> and 
excuse the technology. This is a, a website that we worked with another person who's developed. It's called Is This Thing On? Relating to Yellowstone. And he, this gentleman has done a really great job of taking all of our data and plotting it. And I'm sorry, I can't do this on one screen. For every station in Yellowstone, he has now pulled all the data from our servers. And there's, for example, Horse Butte at West Yellowstone, West Yellowstone Boundary, the Madison River, the Nine Mile Bridge. Here's Maple Creek. We just had a swarm today of earthquakes. These little uh, signals. These are 15 minute uh, windows. The line goes around, comes around, and around. So there's four of these lines per hour. There's Norris Junction, Norris Museum, and you can go to this site and you can see all the way down to Flag Ranch. So anyone can go to the to this side and you can see these these data and you can see that they're in real time and you get a general overview of the system. It's it's about seven minutes delayed. Now the uh, this is called the California Real Time Earthquake Data System, but they've fortunately been able to integrate it, and now it's a global network system. So all the data in the world come in to an integrated group at Caltech and the University of California Berkeley, and they produce this kind of, of map, and it's real time for for the world, if you wish. And I'm going to escape because. I'm going to go to that window separately. <coughs> Sorry about this technology. Oops. This is supposed to be turned off. We had a little, I had to link all these things. There's about 10 different servers, and that's tricky business. I had this all up to show. We'll center it on, on Yellowstone. So there's the real-time data for Yellowstone occurring right now. And if I span out, you see the San Andreas Fault. These are the earthquakes, of course, San Francisco. We have Blanco Fractures on all the way to San Diego. But look at this. You all know where that's from? Oklahoma. It's not fracking. It's fluid reinjection. They're different. That's causing a lot of confrontation, of course, right now uh, with people in Oklahoma, because these are producing up to magnitude 4, 4.2 earthquakes. There's a network for citizens. Anybody can join this network, and it's called Point Catcher. And when you log in, you can ask them for a seismograph, and they'll send it to you. And you have to agree to put it on your computer, and you have to then have a web accessible. Now, Fortune, for example, all the Mac laptops all have the accelerometers built in, but you can get these systems. I'll show you the picture from a, a faculty member at Stanford who creates real-time maps from this global citizens network. <coughs> So there's a picture of a terminal. This little box right here is actually an accelerometer. It's a seismograph. It's about one inch by one inch by one inch. And they might charge you $40 for it. But you hook it up, and you have then all the data from their network. And here is their network for the whole globe. It has it for the whole globe itself. So each one of these is one of these systems. And these are citizens who have either been given those little seismographs or they paid $40 for it. But they've all agreed to be online. The first one we built, we put it at the Red Rock Ranch at Grovon Canyon. 
because we're having the Grow Walk Swarm back in 2009 and 10. So there's actually one in Wyoming, and uh, I think it's still working. But these are citizens' instruments, so you know how reliable it depends on how a person wants to actually run them. Now, how many iPhone apps? There's probably dozens. I'm just going to show you two of them. This is a real-time list from this Quake Watch system. The earthquakes are listed by the source, USGS, National Research Council, whoever, from all around the globe. And these are usually within uh, a few minutes of when they occur. So this system goes out and gets the earthquake data from all the networks in the world and posts them. So you can get real-time earthquakes from around the world and uh, see them, and they will create some app as well. I didn't want to show it. But I did want to show you, you can download these little apps called an eye size bumper. And so you can actually see the horizontal components. This is east, west, north, south, and vertical. Of a little seismograph, it's this big, this big, this big. And you put it on your desk, you can record earthquakes. I have them all over my office. <laughs> That's why I lose them. In fact, they're so little, I, I lose them. But, you know, that's it. Now, the, uh, the GPS data we're showing comes from this group called UNAVCO. UNAVCO is, a, again, a consortium of universities that was formed uh, back in the 1990s to perform and to do, develop GPS instrumentation and to then develop a, essentially a pool of instruments that we could all apply for. I had half a dozen. These folks now have 1,000 GPS units that are across the United States. I picked this one up because this is Moose Pond. And if you walk along, there's Moose Pond right there. The next time you hike across Moose Ponds, look up to the west and the top of the cliff, and you'll see the antenna for the GPS station. And you can log on. And then you can see the actual north, south, east, west, vertical component. And each dot here is one day. So they're all conglomerated. And, uh, but you can see how that, size, that GPS station is actually moving. And that's right here in Grand Teton National Park. And we have a colleague who has put all of these data together. And you can go to his website. And he has all of the GPS data in the world. And I'm like, so yeah, when you can see them, there's all the stations. There's literally several thousand GPS. These are permanent GPS stations. These are not backpacks. I'll show you a picture. I'll show you a picture of what, and I'll show you a close-up. These are instruments that can record within a millimeter. They're thirty thousand dollars. So we pay it, and that's, and that's the systems that we have to run for this kind of research. And here is the GPS network for the Snake River. Here's the Wasatch Front Stations. Here's the Snake River Plain. We put these in back in 1990, 1987. And we put a line that goes across the Boar Peak Earthquake. Well, let's just go in and take a look. Now, I'm interacting with servers. This is, uh, they're on my servers, all my other people's. I'm going to take you to this place right here called White Lake, which is a north of Fishing Bridge, 10 to 15 miles. It's part of a volcanic research dome. And it's the place where we discovered this accelerated uplift of the Yellowstone caldera. And here is the data. I don't have enough room there. I want to show you the whole thing. So I'm scaling as we go. There's the north-south component. What is the scale on that? It scales in millimeters. <laughs> so that's 0 to 50 millimeters. That's north-south. That's east-west. But here is when we discovered the vertical component showed that the Yellowstone caldera was going up back in 2004. And you can see the signal climbed to about 2010. 
It was a total of 25 centimeters of uplift. So, fourth of a yardstick. Then it went down, but we thought we were in good shape. Look what we got going on right now. Everything turned around in April, May ish. And I'll show you some. First of all, there's this, before I get to that, there's a, a, a system built by UNAMCO, it's called the Jules Verne Voyager, and they put together a global net and a whole network for looking at the heavens, if you wish, and if you log into that, and I'm going to log into a system called, essentially, the Jules Verne Voyager for the Earth. Now, Here's the Earth, and you can go up here and you can pick topography, gray topography, and I like to leave the color on. But then you can go over here and you can put in rivers, political boundaries, earthquakes, which I'm going to put on here. And then you go over. There's all the earthquakes in the world on this voyage. And again, it's in here real time. And you can look at you can look at focal mechanisms to feed to your heart content. Tectonic plates. This is over which, what kind of time frame, uh, Mark, where was that data showing earthquakes like happening? Well, that's probably the last 10 years and up to date now. I'm not exactly sure what their time window is. And coastlines and etc. So, the Jules Bird Voyager. And it's a neat tool that anybody can use and it's accessible, uh, I'll have the websites for it. Now, there's a USGS site called the Earthquake Notification System. And again, anybody can log in and you can outline the areas that you want to get a notification of an earthquake. Now, I happen to have on mine, I have one for the Utah, I have one for Yellowstone, <coughs> And uh, you, when you log in, or there's an earthquake that occurs in one of these boxes, it sends you out a signal to your cell phone, literally within seconds. And so, but it's customized. You can outline the area. You can outline the magnitude, upper magnitude, lower magnitude. I set mine up so in the middle of the night it doesn't trigger it under magnitude threes, or I go, I'd be awake all night. It also is my belt. So the Earthquake Notification Service, you can log in, you have to get your own account. Once you get your own account, you set up your own profile, I meaning you set up your own custom box, boxes, if you wish, if you want to have these announcements. So it's a very useful tool. Well, at the end here, this is the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory site. This is a partnership that we formed, University of Utah, the Park Service, and the USGS back in 1995-ish. We've added several state geological surveys in addition to these, but we at the University of Utah, we're kind of the base of operations because we have all of the data coming in. But when you get here, of course we have an outline of Yellowstone. So we're waiting for a server from mm -hmm. the USGS. It'll get here. Oh. What? Bunch of cuts. <laughs> and so I'm going to lift this up. Whoops. We'll make this smaller. So you get a map of Yellowstone, and before I go down with the legend, we have the roads, we have the outline of the youngest caldera, and we have all the instruments. Now if you go down to the bottom, whoops, there. Then you can select if you want to show all the cameras in Yellowstone, webcams, all the GPS receivers, the seismic stations, the temperatures, temperature loggers, tilt meters, etc. 
and I can put them on. I'm going to put them on the last 131 days. And I'm going to go in here and shut off some of these other ones because of the seismic data. So it's intriguing. There's earthquakes guys, right there. Last 180 days in real time for the ones that are coming in today. So this is again a website that we've put together jointly, the University of Utah and the USGS in Menlo Park. And all of these data are available and you can again custom this, customize this system to look at different magnitudes, different periods of time. But what's also on this site, there's earthquakes, there's GPS deformation, which I'm not going to show you. There's temperatures at NORAS, there's a NORAS temperature system. Stream flows, hydrology, gases, etc. So these are really very useful tools that everybody has access to. Now, how do we do all of this? Well, we have a network of, as I mentioned, we now have 35 seismic stations uh, over a real-time telemeter, and we have about 25 GPS stations. Now, these are permanent GPS stations. I'll show a picture in a moment. We've got more than, actually, about $8 million now of all of these systems we put together with funding from the National Science Foundation, USGS, and the university. So this whole system has been integrated. I won't go through the details except to say we run from Flag Ranch all the way up to Mammoth, from here in West Yellowstone all the way to Parker Peak for the seismic, roughly the same for the GPS. Half our stations are wilderness, which means I have to go there. <coughs> but what's been happening, here's a time history of earthquake data and deformation data. Back in 1923, they installed benchmarks on the roads when they built, and they actually asphalted the roads in Yellowstone. And they actually were, they put in benchmarks, and in 1975, we actually went in and surveyed those benchmarks, and we found that the earth was going up at about 2.2 centimeters per year. And then it turned around, and it went down. Now, this is a inside of the caldera set of data. This is outside the caldera. Now we plotted here by quartiles the numbers of earthquakes per quartile. And so the big question here is we had a huge swarm of earthquakes in 1985. <coughs> Literally thousands of earthquakes of magnitudes, one or two up to four and a half. They were so big that people in West Yellowstone were leaving West Yellowstone because they were shaking West Yellowstone. The swarms on the northwest side between the, the Madison Canyon. And we plotted over here both red and green, uh, blue. Red are the earthquakes that occur as swarms, and blue are the earthquakes that are independent. And it was this downward slope that I was watching, and suddenly 2004 it took off. Seven centimeters per year. So all you geologists know that the average slip rate on the San Andreas Fault is, what be, 2.5 centimeters per year. So we're going up three times faster than the San Andreas is loading. Then it curtailed a bit, and it went down. So we have this cycle of ups and downs, if you wish, outside of the caldera, Norris, Kaiser Basin to the west, you can see it was going down when the caldera was going up. When the caldera was going down, it was coming up. So we have this synchronicity, and the question is, what's causing it? But my statement is, Yellowstone's always shaking, it's always moving, and it's always baking. <laughs> now, how hot is it? People think Yellowstone is really hot. Well, if you try to ski around Yellowstone, you wouldn't know it isn't. This is a map of heat flow for the western U.S. And sorry, these are in heat flow units. Uh, just saying, it's red. It's a high flux. We measure heat flow in terms of milliwatts per square meter per second. And, uh, but here's the one for Yellowstone. And I put in bars because they're more understandable. We've made heat flow measurements using both uh, thermal probes in the lake and using geochemistry on the west side of the park. Here are the numbers. Outside of Yellowstone, 125 towards Cody, 50. Then look, 35,000, 2,000, 44,000, 40, thousands of milliwatts per square meter. This is conductive heat flux. The heat is emanating 
is 30 to 40 times the continental average, and the annual output is 6 gigawatts. And it's produced by their crystallization of about a tenth of a cubic kilometer of basaltic magma. So magma's cooling releases heat, comes on the surface, and we have Yellowstone. Now what's kind of neat about this, there was kind of an unappreciated hazard. We did, we did thermal probes at all these little points in the lake. And we measured this thermal gradient. That means the number of degrees C per kilometer. That's kind of how we think. Well, this is actually in heat flow. And when we measured it, we found the south end of the lake was kind of normal. And suddenly, we had this immense amount of increase in heat. I showed you up to 44,000. And West Thumb, here's kind of a plot showing the relative height of the excess heat at Mary Bay. And here's a plot of temperature. This is the boiling point of water. These are some of the data points that we've taken uh, in the north end of the lake. These are actually data points we measure right here. We come right down the boiling point curve. And what happens when we go to the right of that curve? It boils and explodes. And so I've calculated the depth of the boiling point. And the depth of the boiling point up here it turns out to be about, 10, about, about 5 meters. In other words, if you went up to the north end of the lake and suddenly discharged the lake by 5 meters or so, the whole thing would explode. Very big, probably double its size. So we don't want to go up to the fishing bridge and suddenly open up the Yellowstone River to a sudden down drop of Yellowstone Lake. But of course, these things can happen during big earthquakes. By the way, this is the place which is the shallowest nearest the magma. Just to let you know, I do get the back country. This happens to be Hot Springs Basin. This is the biggest geyser basin in the world. It's 25 kilometer miles north of the fishing bridge. You know, this zone of high, as a sulfate hydrothermal system, there's no geysers. So tourists don't like to go out. And there's lots of grids. Dry steam fumaroles. If you stand within a foot of these fumaroles, the steam's coming out and get yourself burned. And if you go down that stream, you see places like these, these, these geyserite mountains. Totem, we call them the totem forest. And it is a long haul into this place, two days. Once you get there, same kind of steam is effusing up through these, these, sap up, these towers, if you wish. Uh, geyserite fluid comes up, it, it deposits the outside and creates the total forest. Now, again, moving along here, these are seismic data we've done with reflection surveys of Yellowstone Lake. But this is the important one over at West Thumb. Well, first of all, this is a typical seismic profile. We, we use a seismic source and it reflects off the bottom of the lake. So this is the lake bottom. Then it reflects off all the rock layers. Well, this is a fault. It's actually off the shore of Yellowstone Hotel over towards Stevenson Island. And this is a drop, and this is a little valley that down dropped on this fall. And you can see it's down dropped the youngest sediments, meaning it's broken the youngest rocks that are at the bottom of the lake, which are probably on the order. These probably were sort of associated with earthquakes of only a few hundreds of thousand years. But we went down into West Thumb, and here's the bottom of the lake, and it ought to look like that. But look what we discovered. Suddenly, everything was obscured. It's obscured because this is the top of a steam magmatic system. And you can see it's only down under 25 feet in the bottom of West Thumb. Well, I'm going to take you now and show you some of the new work we're doing in the Norris area. This is a background earthquake map that I already mentioned. There's a zone of earthquakes that come in from the West Yellowstone area into Yellowstone, then the disease north and north south trending liniments of earthquakes. The green, excuse me, the blue are earthquakes that occur in swarms. And Yellowstone is dominated by swarms. 50% of the earthquakes occur in swarms, meaning very close spatial and time locations of earthquakes. Like a buzzing bee, you know? It's what we call it swarms. And they all occur over minutes, hours, day, or months. And we never have a big earthquake in a swarm because they just peak to a high rate and then die off. 
Well, in uh, 2014, we had a very interesting set of swarms in 2013. Here's Norris Geyser Basin. There's the road to Canyon, the road up to Mattel. These are the active falls, Waternary Falls, that have been mapped. And we began noticing in September these swarms of earthquakes off to the west, the northwest up toward Mount Holmes, January, same set of general location, earthquakes occurring very, very rapidly in these little clusters. And this is March, here's April, and then we had these events right here. You can see them by far better than I can. Put them all together. So we had this very active area late 2013 and early 2014. And on top of it all, we had a magnitude 4.2 earthquake. This is really the Sulfa Terra earthquake, I call it. Here's the Norris area. People call it the Norris earthquake, but this is the Sulfa Terra plateau. And this was an earthquake that was really of great interest to us. Now, 4.2 is, you know, you California guys don't pay attention to it. It's the biggest earthquake in 30 years in Yellowstone. But here's what's interesting. I plotted here the numbers of earthquakes in these both red and blue numbers. So over here, this is the numbers of earthquakes uh, during these periods, 2013 and 14. And inside the caldera, we had this earthquake sequence of, whoa, up to the 4.8 earthquakes. 4.8, I'm sorry, not 4.8. And if you go outside the caldera, the white light, for example, or off the east side of the caldera, nothing's going on. So we've had this earthquake it began in 4008 and immediately the caldera went down. Well, here's what I think is happening. So we're going to just give you my take on this source of seismicity. There's the Hebden Lake Norris zone, and then these zones of earthquakes that come down into the park and the caldera, and these yellow stars are post caldera volcanic vents. There's about 50 of them, that means they're younger than 640,000 years to as young as 70,000 years right here on top of Pixel Plateau. But before I get to there, I want to point out that Yellowstone, when it starts shaking, it just goes like crazy. These are earthquake areas that earthquakes repeat them. Look, these are identical earthquakes. That's 2006, here's 1994. They just keep popping off and popping off and popping off. There's another example. And we know these things are going all the time. That was my contention, is that Yellowstone is always shaking. And it's shaking by these repeating earthquakes. Well, there's some physics to that, and we wrote this up. And uh, if you're, well, this is for the 1985 swarm. When you start fluidizing a system, here's the main shock and the little aftershocks. As the, hydro, as the, as the fracture opens up, with fracking, natural earth fracking of fluids, the zone of earthquakes gets bigger and bigger. And that's what we attributed this 1985 swarm that I showed you the location. And these earthquakes just repeat themselves one after another. In 2008, we had a big swarm on Yellowstone Lake, and when we modeled it, notice the depth appeared here. This is what we discovered. We discovered a vertical dike of fluids that were coming up, and the earthquakes were at the front of the fluidizing front. So when you push the fluid, magmatic fluid, hydrothermal fluid, into the rocks, you load the stress. This is natural fracking. Same physics exactly, except this is caused by Mother Earth. So with time, you fracture the edge of this, this material goes up, keeps on going and going. And this whole front went for 12 kilometers, about one kilometer per day. It just grew this high rate and then just shut itself off. It shut itself off because it hit the magma chamber where it's hot and you can't fracture the rocks. Now how do we know where all these things occur? This is my cartoon that I did with the BBC. And if you put seismographs all across the surface and you mod <coughs> seismic or you record seismic 
that come up from earthquakes. As they come through the earth, they're either advanced or retarded, depending on their velocity of the rock that they go through. And I'm going to show you one here where it's going to be yellow, where the rock velocities are low. Therefore, it's going to retard the, rock, the seismic velocities. And we call this tomography, topographic inversion. And we use still tens and hundreds of hours of computer time to reconstruct these things that you do when you get an MRI and a doctor does it instantly. It takes us a lot of computer time because we have to elaborate so much of the data. This is our latest set. We used earthquakes. Uh, well, there were 4,000 events from 1985 to 2011. And then we used the later events. And here's the latest one. 4,000 earthquakes. There were 48,000 of these waves that came and were recorded by seismographs. They're shown in black. And these are the earthquakes themselves. And these are the rate paths of the earthquakes. What we wanted is to get full coverage of the caldera. So we had a lot of new stations to the northeast just in the last five, ten years. So we improved the P wave coverage in the northeast caldera. Very excellent <coughs> seismograms, but it still takes tens to hundreds of hours of mega clusters. Here's what we found. So here at the top is a map of vol seismic velocity at two kilometers. If it's red, it's low. If it's blue, it's fast. So geophysicists call this redite, and they call this bluite. We don't know what the rocks are. Five kilometers, low velocity. Eight kilometers, low velocity. 14 kilometers, low velocity. Here's a cross section. So starting down fishing, excuse me, down uh, this would be southwest of Old Faithful. And you can see this body extends <coughs> past the Ballard Lake down to the Sour Creek Dome and it comes up to the surface roughly at Hot Springs Basin. Now we model this as actually being partial melt, about 10% melt. And we model this as actually hydrothermal fluid, <coughs> maybe melt, that comes right up to near the surface, Mirror Plateau. So next time you're hiking the Mirror Plateau, give me a buzz and I'll tell you what it's like on a foot. <laughs> And here's what it looks like. So this is going to be a 3D model of the seismic low velocity body that outlines this new body that we just discovered. It's, you can see, shallowest in the deepest in the southeast and shallowest in the northeast. Here's all the earthquakes that we used in the topographic inversion. I know it looks kind of like an upside down or like a camelback. That's just the outline of the system itself. Barbara, the units, kilometers? Here, these are in kilometers. That's all I speak. What's kind of neat about it is this. This is the outline of the top of the magma body. Now, remember I told you that the age progression of the sink of plane, oldest to youngest. We try to explain why this is the caldera boundary 640,000 years ago, but this magma system is now 17 kilometers, 20 kilometers out to the front. Well, I think it's because plate tectonics just simply said we're moving across this hotspot and the magmas are coming up further and further to the northeast. It's the plate's moving two and a half centimeters per year, and actually the distance from here to here is 17 kilometers. And that's just think, is the distance of the magma system coming up from the, the plume. So here's kind of my idea of what this whole system looks like. You have a plume down at about 60 kilometers. Magma comes off the plume. It partially melts the Earth's crust, creating a body that's both basaltic and rhyolitic. And this is what this, I, I made the actual image of what we've now produced with topographic imaging. I'm not going to go in here except to say we exhaled fluids from this magmatic system. Well, that produces the uplift of the whole caldera. Fluids flow from the magma body into the surrounding region. Earthquake storms are triggered by this excess fluid pressure. And outward migration of magmatic fluids create these big swarms that are on the outside of the caldera. Okay, so here's the story. 
Remember this one right here? Everybody said that was due to Yellowstone. Well, 7 point, it's actually a 7.3 in MW. Here's the magnitude 6.1 in Norris. Now, here's the new calculations. If we, t if we calculate the stress of this earthquake, this is West Yellowstone Basin out here. Red Canyon Fault, Hickman Lake Fault. So we let this fault rupture, and it decreases the stress perpendicular to it, and it increases the stress on the ends. We call this a dog boat pattern. And look where the earthquakes all occur. The aftershocks for tens of years occur out across this zone of seismicity on the northwest side of the caldera. So I contend that this part of Yellowstone, the seismicity, is related to the Hebgen Lake Fault, ruptured in 1959. And what's important about it, if you plot the Hebgen Lake earthquake, the default loading rate is about one and a half millimeters per year. This thing can last for 100, almost 1,000 years of aftershocks. So we got a lot of earthquakes left going on in Hebgen Lake Basin. On the other hand, how do we explain these? Well, we think what's happening, these are alignments of volcanic vents. Here's the ones on the north of the Madison Plateau, Atlas Corridor. And we think these earthquakes are occurring on very falls that develop a basin range extension, and we're just seeing the stress superimposed. It's been covered by young volcanics, but the whole stress field is simply, this is an extension of, there's the Teton Fault. These were old faults. These were old basin range faults. If you had been around here two million years ago, the Teton Range would probably continue all the way up across Yellowstone, almost to the Madison Plateau. The Big Game Ridge, the Red Mountains would continue up across Yellowstone. They, of course, have been now exploded upon by three giant super eruptions and then covered by a lot of young ones. Now, I'm not getting into volcanology. I want to get into the geophysics to convince you that in fact, what these earthquake swarms are, are release valves. In other words, <coughs> Yellowstone goes up and then down and up and down and up and down. I contend when you go down after the 85 swarm and you go down after this big uplift, here's the two big swarms. This is a 2010 swarm of Madison Plateau, 1985. Caldera subsidence It's because fluids are migrating outwards. And if you didn't have them migrating outwards, what would happen? You can't keep putting magma in continuously for thousands upon thousands of years. You'd have a lot more surface youthful volcanism. And these are basically periods of time when this caldera subsidence is releasing <laughs> fluids laterally and, uh, into these big earthquake swarms on the northwest side and east side of the Yellowstone caldera. If we didn't have them, We'd be in big doo, doo Okay. Now we do other kinds of imaging. We do electrical imaging. Here's the seismic image of the plume, the one already published. Well, now we're doing magnetofluoric imaging, where we use the natural Earth's currents and we calculate the resistivity of the Earth. And we found this annual this zone of very low resistivity around the plume. So there's seismically imaged plume, here is now the annulus of mineralized fluids, and it's now making the whole plume twice as wide. It goes from 50 kilometers to it. This is probably due to fluids that are coming off of this magma, this partial melt of the Yellowstone plume. And that's what it looks like. I want you to get the perspective. You're looking down, there's Yellowstone. That's a tiny little place. Here's the same river plain. There's the plume, and here's the the annulus of the low resistivity body around the edge, just to the north. Well, so what I think is happening again is we're, fluids are coming off the plume, we generate this magma body beneath Yellowstone itself. So I have to convince, especially the press, Yellowstone has two magma systems, one in the plume at 60 kilometers, Two to three percent melt, and one near the surface of about ten percent melt. These are partial melt, meaning that only about ten percent of the rock is actually melted. The rest is solid but hot rock. 
So these magma reservoirs are not 100% melting rocks like you see at Kilauea Iki, or you see coming off of strata volcanoes like Stromboli, which is active this week. These are partial melts. Take a sponge, think about 10% of the sponge's holes, but that's the water, the voids, and that's what we have here. It is plenty hot. So I want to convince you, anytime you go to Yellowstone, anytime, you drive north from Jackson, up from Idaho Falls, down from Cody, and I mean, down from Bozeman, and from Cody, you go uphill. And you go uphill, there's a the plot of the topography as a function of distance from the center of Yellowstone. 400 meters. Yellowstone is a topographic swell just like Hawaii is. You just didn't notice it because there weren't any fish swimming around it. But if you go to Hawaii, you're sitting on top of the Hawaiian swell. But Yellowstone, you're on top of the Yellowstone topographic spot. And it's because these hot rocks are low density, therefore they're buoyant, and they are less dense, they want to float. They lift the surface of the earth up. Okay, this is what just came out. You've probably seen the press about this, it was released last week. A brand new national hazard map. And uh, I'll go into the details, red, we have the highest probability of occurrence of earthquakes in San Andreas, eastern front of the Sierras. Here's the Intermountain region. Go to the Wasatch, Bear Lake, Star Valley, and Yellowstone to the south, Hampton Lake Basin, Lower Peak. Of course, it's Central U.S., 1810, 1811. New Madrid earthquake, the Charleston earthquake, 1996. But this is a strange pattern to have inside of a continent. You know, we're 1,500 kilometers from the, this coast over here into this hot spot. Well, the hot spot's there because it's a plume. Okay. <laughs> I didn't name it this. One of my colleagues did. <laughs> this new map shows, this is the difference between the 2008 map and the brand new map. And uh, the difference in red means you've increased that seismic hazard. Now, the reason we know this, we've added all this new GPS data, so we have much better coverage of the whole western U.S. And you can see we've increased the hazard in the Wasatch up through Star Valley. But look, there's the Teton Fall. It's gone down a little bit. I got the numbers. Everything else in Yellowstone went up 0.1 G. That's actually pretty small. But Teton Fall went down. So this new hazard map has just come out. And I suggest you take a look at it. Go to the USGS National Hazard website. And you can download all of this information. So Yellowstone erupts every 700,000 years ago. That was the first giant eruption 2.06 million years ago. Inter event time 760,000 to the next one. It's on the park here in blue. And we had the Yellowstone Caldera, that's the name that's been given, 640,000 years ago. So 640,000 since the last one. The average injury event time is 710,000 years, despite of what the press says. Take my numbers, guys. These are the correct ones. We're still 70,000 years away, believe me. But we can only take the time between events. So we have two numbers. Would you predict anything in the stock market on the basis of two days of stocks? <laughs> Come on, folks. We do not know from this information how close we are to the next generation. I don't know. Don't ask me. <laughs> so this is the last big eruption. Since then, in time, we've had about 70 or 80 small volcanic eruptions. The last one 70,000 years ago. <laughs> Nothing from, from there to here. The average repeat time of these smaller eruptions 19,000 years. So there's room for three <laughs> eruptions. Well, this is the latest full PSA check. Seismic hazard analysis. This, uh, this is a very detailed study we've made. Here is the Star Valley, Grand Valley Fault. Here's the Teton Fault. Uh, the Mount Sheridan, South Arm Fault have been light. The reddest and deepest is right here. And that's where we can expect this is a return time, 2% 50 years. You say, what the hell is he talking about? 2% 50 years is 2,500 years. This is repeat total repeat time. But it gets up into the 
you can see it gets to the ground. It's almost six tenths to one full G of ground motion. A house will tumble with three tenths of a G right here. Bridges go down at 30 to 40. Big tall buildings are damaged and destroyed at 0.6. Here's what we got facing us. This is actually brown in here, but didn't come up with the slide. Big peak ground acceleration. And the people, FEMA just put out a new <coughs> peak ground acceleration map. And you can see in red the highest from 30 to 60 percent G is associated with the Teton Fault. So it's very capable of shaking the entire valley. Now this map was down roughly to Wilson. Here, well, here's Jackson. There's Wilson up in the valley. This is what FEMA is now using as the basis map for the hazard. So what's the biggest ones? I'm going to show you here at the end. I'm going to calculate the probability percent of different kinds of things. And then I'm going to calculate the risk. So you take how often bad things happen, false volcano eruptions, hydrothermal events, and then you multiply the area to get the risk. Risk is the exposure that you and I take by living where we live. OK, the first one, super caldera eruptions. 0.00014% per year. Well, you don't care about that. Well, here's it is over here in the risk factor. Post caldera flows, that's these 30 or 40 flows that have come across Yellowstone. These are volcanic flows, rhyolite flows, things you see commonly on, on the news of small flows, small eruptions around the world. 0.005% per year. Do you worry about that? By the way, I took this to my insurance agency here in the state And I said I wanted ash insurance. Ash, you know, that's what comes out of these guys. And they say, oh, you're the yellow side. Right. Then you go to these big hydrothermal explosions. These are large steam gas explosions, Murray Bay and Yellowstone, Pocket Basin down by Old Faithful. Well, look. These are only, these are tiny. These are only a kilometer or so wide. So they don't produce much exposure. There's the action, guys. <laughs> earthquakes. Magnitude 7 earthquakes. Now you start 0.12% per year. And that's pretty high. 100 years, you got 100%. And the risk factors, you can see, dominated by earthquakes. Not volcanic eruptions. So the biggest Yellowstone hazard risk is magnitude 7 earthquakes and larger, not hydrothermal eruptions or volcanic eruptions, or super volcanic eruptions. We've got to get off that hype. <laughs> this just came out. If you saw this in the last couple of days, there was a... Oh no, I mean, this has been coming out. And we finally put together something to, to, to go against this thing. And you can go to our website and see it. But, this is what this is probably a pretty good depiction of what a super eruption would probably well the heights of course exaggerated, but coming the ashes coming the whole of the western US. So again, this is where you can get all of these data. They're free and their tools are all available. And uh, whoops, I don't want that. First of all, uh, where am I? Right there. Visit Yellowstone. <laughs> <laughs> I said they were doing up to date. You ever been to the Thoroughfare Cabin? Who's here been to Thoroughfare? You know where it is? No. Southeast corner of Yellowstone. This is Hawk's Rest. And there's a fire that got light on top. This is how I go in. It sits right here. We're putting in a brand new seismic station as we speak. So on Hawks Rest, <coughs> that's how I go in. Helicopter with the equipment, that's what the repeater looks like. Added a new solar panel inside that little building is $30,000 worth of new seismic ground. Sends the data by radio telemetry to Mount Washburn, comes back to us in real time. 
So my years have done a good job. I predicted you guys all earthquakes, right? <laughs> and volcanic eruptions. Now, of course, that's me skiing the Teton Fall in my dog, and this is me in the thoroughfare. If you wouldn't mind just a moment, I, I want you to realize that I'm also <laughs> what I did before all of this. Before I did this, let me show you the end. This is what my graduate student did. He sat down and asked sulfate water. And, all and he bent over. And his soles came off. He's now the director of the National Earthquake Information. <laughs> think he'd listen to his advisor. PH minus one. Here's what I did. One other part of my life, I began working some really <laughs> serious stuff. 1962 and 63. I was the American exchange scientist with the British Antarctic Survey under Secretary Dean Rusk. And I went down with the British, with the British onto the ice. And here's a picture going into uh, South Georgia, Cumberland Glacier, doing gravity measurements. This is out in some big basalt when they coming into you there. And this is the grave of Sir Ernest Shackleton. I've been Trey Shackleton trial all the way from Hope Bay to South Georgia. Of course, I was in a British iceberg. <laughs> when I got down on the ice, we went out and did a lot of kind of serious things. But we went out once, and we had dog teams. We also had snowmobiles. We decided we'd go out, and there I am leading this team of about 15 Greenland Huskies. But we'd set up camps out on the ice. We'd go back. We went back, in this case, you know, about 20, 30 kilometers. Problem is, we ran across crevasse. The dogs got across. Sled went in, I went in, and the guy who was with me went down to the bottom of his rope. Spiral fractured his lower part of his leg. He had the guts to take his camera out of his apartment, and he's looking back up a feet, <laughs> dangling on a rope. We got him out, shot him full of morphine, then he shot me full of morphine because I actually took <laughs> part of my heel. And we took off, and this gentleman rescued us. And he got the bronze medal from the Queen. <laughs> These are some of my London Ice skiing pictures. I was a lot of Swiss in me. I've been a professor of ETH in Zurich. This is skiing Eagleberg. We climb up here. We came up here and tried to ski off this little cliff. It was it, this is what it looked like. And we ski down, you can see that we came back up. We got back up to the peak. And my colleague broke out. <clears throat> that nice bottle of white wine. <laughs> That's the best thing you can have if you want to ski. <coughs> kind of prepared places. Here we are skiing into a place called Pichu, right there on the Italian border. That's what it's like going up. When you cross country folks, you want to ski that? I shouldn't have. That's in the Peach Bernina coming up. When you get there, we come up and came back down to one of these remote huts. Hutton Guard came out and gives us a glass of schnapps and we went on our way. We stayed there for two days and skied the heck out of this, this area right here. And if you go up to the Pete's Midel, we skied finally up through here, around the top, into the top of this peak. Pete's Midel is a peak up there. So there we are getting ready. We came across, we got to the hut, stayed over, got up early in the morning, and then we decided to go across. This is a it's a Bergstrom, and it drops down a thousand meters. Can I go straight down? So we couldn't use ropes. Why? Because if one of us slipped, you take everybody else out. Well, there was a hut load of truck drivers watching us. We got across over to about here. They saw that we had made it, and they took off. And here they all are on top of the peak. They passed us. These are, these are Swiss truck drivers. How many truck drivers in America on I-80 could do that? <laughs> here's skiing Mont Blanc. And then here's skiing Mont Blanc. Rear de Gloss. So there's the top of Mont Blanc. Take the two trams and we hike up on top. Then we come down to what's called the Guy de Rapine. It's called the Shark. And it has a reason to be called the Shark. Because this is what you ski down. And you ski down with pairs of people. and. Uh, guide who was with said, you stay within my tracks coming down because these glaciers, I mean these avalanches were coming in front of us and after us. And I can tell you guys, I know 
you guys are backcountry skiers, but I can ski behind his tracks within a millimeter. <laughs> <laughs> that was my eyes. That's where I started flying, you guys. Class 62G in the U.S. Air Force, and there I am doing my British Antarctic Survey thing. With that, I'll stop. Thanks. But I wanted to see those last ones because I'm a real human being like you are too. I'll answer any questions that you'd like to ask. Um, two quick questions. If there was a large earthquake event in the valley here, what kind of earth motion difference would you see between the valley floor and the foothills or the mountain? Well, the, the question is, if you have a big earthquake on the Teton Fault, uh, what would be the ground motion difference between being in the valley and being on solid bedrock? Right. Well, what happens in the sediments, and there's roughly 15, 20,000 feet of sediments, so the valley is actually lower than the top of the Tetons are higher because of the fall over 10 million years. Those sediments are very, have very low elastic moduli, so when you pass away through them, that amplifies the ground motion. And in bedrock, the amplification is, you call that one, in the valley it could be as much as five to ten times higher. And then you showed some citizen accelerometers. Yep. How do you anchor those so you get good reliable readings? I mean, you just can't set them on your desk, right? Well, I do. <laughs> <laughs> set them on a foundation block? Or I, I actually, I, I, I put them on the, some concrete foundations and I, and I just put them on with the rocks. Yeah, or, I have them on my desk so people can come in and shake them and shake them. <laughs> come stomp no, them. The best thing is to put them on top. Put them in your basement and your yeah, corner of your basement. Well, you, uh, you have to have a computer within about 10 feet of it. But, uh, let's see, is there Wi Fi? There's Wi Fi for them now. No, they're very easy to attach. We've actually screwed them in. You can epoxy them in, or you just leave them on top of your desk. And by the way, on top of the desk, you measure everything. You're going to come down Stop the hall down and the earthquake. <laughs> Slam at the door. <laughs> How can you tell that North American crust is moving three centimeters a year? I guess we know from all of the GPS measurements the whole North American plate's moving away from the Mid Atlantic Ridge. So that's the edge of the North American plate, the Atlantic. It's moving southwesterly, two and a half centimeters per year, principally because of all the new GPS. We have thousands of GPS points now. And North American plates. We can measure the absolute location in an astronomical format. We can do it with respect to the moon or Mars. Same, same velocity. Now you mentioned earlier on that if the, the seismic activity in the uh, Teton along the fault is lower than in a lot of others. Is that bad news because it's building up and it's not being released? Well, you can take that for is, it, is the seismic gap good for you or not? Seismic gaps are defined as areas, gaps in. Right, Pete? This is the old theory of plate tectonics. When you have big faults that are active and no earthquakes, you're still stressing the fault. You're still stretching the valley. In the case of yeah, Teton, I, I did this wasn't a Teton talk. I didn't intend to get into there. But if you take you a point. It when you first what? Started, so. I know, I put it in. If you put a point over in the Groenlands and measure the actual horizontal motions, it's everything's moving to the southwest. Jackson Hole, Teton Block, Teton Valley. But it's moving faster to the west. So the relative motion is you're extending the valley. So it means it's stretching. When you stretch a rubber band, it snaps when it reaches its strength. You don't believe me, try it. What is that? That's an earthquake. Same physics. This is a Teton question again, but let's say there's a 6.8 or 7.2 like the notes have been laid. Um, up near the dam, up near there, uh, how much of that water is going to come down? How high up will it come up? I'm not worried areas? about the dam. I'm not worried about the water. If we have a magnitude 7 earthquake on the Teton Fault, the whole fault ruptures. In the first 30 seconds, Jackson's gone. <laughs> you know, it's going to take 8 to 10 hours for the water to come down. This is going to just clean things out for us. <laughs> 
So the story of this Teton, the Teton Dam was raised 39 feet to get up that And it's only full, it's only topped out as about three or four months a year. So if only release 39 feet, it's a natural lake. The west side is a fall. So I'm worried about the earthquake. I would probably wouldn't even care about the water, even though I live up in the uh, The earthquake is the big thing. It's going to shake the ground violently over 1G, violent ground shaking. You're going to have loss of buildings, you're going to have loss of roads and lives in the first 30 minutes. 75 years away. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Then you have to remember about the uh, earthquakes, though. What? The thing you have to, that's me. Wow. <laughs> the thing you have to remember about earthquakes is that the safest place you can be is in your uh, private home. I grew up in LA, actually. Uh, then asleep in my bed when a 7 1 occurred, and my wife was busily trying to get me out of bed, saying that things were going to follow me. But seriously, if you get in a good, safe place like in your bathroom where you have lots of corners supporting things, and the latest research is that <coughs> you actually want to get not under your bed, but right next to your bed. <coughs> so if things come down, the bed actually supports stuff and gives you what they call a triangle of life right next to things. Uh, so the key thing is that we have a seven and a half. You're probably going to live through it. Real question, what are you going to do for the next two weeks? Six months. Uh, it won't take six months. I mean, they'll finally get here. But, you know, if it happens right now, hey, okay, we're all out on the lawn and, you know, you know, get out the camp stove and have a lot of fun. If it happens in February, folks, uh, you need to have a serious sleeping bag. You've got plenty of water. You've got hot water heaters and toilets and things like that. You've got plenty of water. But for about uh, about a week, you need to figure out how to take care of yourself. And uh, the other thing I'd warn you, Bob's not worried about the, the, the dam and all that. I'm not in the floodplain. <laughs> I don't live in Moose. <laughs> and if we have a really bad earthquake, I would not worry about all those dishes and, and pictures on the floor. I'd, uh, I'd start a walk to get some high ground. <laughs> and uh, for all you skiers among you, just hope you're not on the, on the tram when it goes. <laughs> you might still be on. <laughs> You mentioned LIDAR in one of the graphs. Do you have LIDAR data, and how does that compare to your GPS data for vertical elevation? We, we have LIDAR data for the whole Teton Fault. I didn't put it in. But LIDAR means light emitting radar, which we use actually light beams. The answer is, we just get displaced when we made one flight. Yeah. I mean, if we, if we repeated, like we could if we had the money. Those are expensive operations. But we can, when we map with the Teton Fault with LIDAR, we found an additional half dozen new strands that we could not see before. All the way up, we saw faults up into the foot wall, I mean, out across the foot wall, Taggart, Bradley Lake, and some in the hanging wall, halfway up Teton Range. Is there earth mapping radar from satellite? How does that compare to the accuracy of the LIDAR? Oh, LIDAR is much more accurate. That's going to have to be the last question. We're just uh, running out of time here. So I'd like to say three things real quick. One, in uh, September, there's going to be two great talks, the first and third Tuesday. Uh, Linda Brigliano from the National Forest Service will be talking about the robot wilderness. And then two weeks later, Mr. Mike Adler will be talking about uh, Bhutan, a little bit about geology and showing some fantastic scenery. Uh, as we leave here, I really appreciate if you on that side of the aisle there would stack chairs against that wall, and if on this side you would stack them over here. And then finally, I'd very much like you to join me in thanking Bob Smith.
Well, he's the one that always sets it up. I'm just wondering if there's any chance to see that on the 